This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hey, my fellow cat loving friends. We are so excited because we, Rita and I, working with behavior, have had a lot of questions about neurological problems that can affect our cats. So we take advantage of the podcast and we find us an expert. And we have Dr. Karen Klein here. She is a veterinarian and she specializes in neurologic issues. And she is here to discuss some of the common neurologic issues that can happen with cats, what that looks like, and what we need to do. We are so excited to talk to her right after this word from our sponsor. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to 19 Cats and Counting. I am your co-host, Linda Hall, here with my ever-gorgeous blonde bombshell, BFF, my ride or die, Rita Reimers. <laughs> with the red eyes right now because allergy season. I'm telling you. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's awful. Let's go so, right to Dr. Karen. She is less. more than just a veterinarian. Oh, she's a lot. She's, you yes. have a lot on your plate. Neurologic anomalies is the subject of the day. But there's other things I'd like to talk to Dr. Karen about sometime, like acupuncture. i got a whole bunch of questions Definitely. for her. Oh, but. my gosh. Would love to. Absolutely. Oh, yes. You've got to come back and I'm talk already about planning the acupuncture. Next show. I know. I am. Let's do it. I have a whole list. God bless <laughs> you. We love it. We learn so much. We do. From specialists like you that help us in our behavior because we are certainly not veterinarians, but we need to know when to say this is above our pay grade. You need this. So first of all, I want to start with the specialties. I'm old. I'm 57. Back oh, in the day. Me. Back I'm in the day. I'm going to be 63 this year. Talk to me when you're 60. <laughs> vets, vets were vets were vets. And now we've got all of these specialists, which makes sense because we do for people too. So how is this helpful and what is it exactly that you're doing? Yeah. And I think that's a really good question. You know, when, just like in human medicine, when we have a certain issue, you know, you go to your general practitioner and they say, gosh, you know, we need to send you to a specialist. And in veterinary medicine, there's a bunch of specialties, like just like internal medicine, neurology, cardiology, radiology, oncology, radiation oncology. So it's a very big corollary to the human, um, you know, situation. But the conduit is your general practitioner. So in terms of neurology, we deal with problems with the brain, the spinal cord and the muscles and nerves, same kind of thing. Um, the only difference is, you know, our exam on a little kitty cat is going to be vastly different than what we do on a human. But nonetheless, you know, we first want to just get a history and make sure that um, everybody's on the same page in terms of what's happening with your little furry creature. Right. And I think sometimes the behavior issues, you know, people think it's a behavior issue and the yep. vet won't necessarily find anything you know, he might know you need to see a neurological specialist like I had. Um, we'll talk about that later. But how do people know this is really behavioral versus I really need to get my cat in to see a specialist because I just give up. This behavior is never going to change. Yeah, really good question. And and that's I get a lot of questions about behavior as well. But some things to look for, especially, you know, if you've got one or two cats or if you've got 11 cats or whatnot. Or 18. <laughs> or 18. Exactly. Whenever I talk to a client about the difference between behavior and neuro, for example, if we see a little kitty cat who's 
failing to jump well because kitty cats are really, really agile. So if they're missing when they're jumping, because, you know, some cats are able to jump all the way up on top of the refrigerator and it's nothing for them. So if they're having trouble with that or if they're circling in one direction or if they're losing their balance, we know that probably that's more of a neurologic issue um, Mm -hmm. than it is a behavioral issue. And also not using those back legs. Remember, kitty cats will sometimes have underlying heart disease where they can throw blood clots to their vessels in their back legs or their front limbs, and they can present not walking or limping. So we need to be keyed in on those things as well. I lost one of my cats, my Colby, to a blood clot. So oh, blood no. clot and well, by the time he came downstairs, he was he died. I couldn't even oh, get him anywhere to get gosh. him like that. It was quick. I think kitty cats are very good at hiding things more so than dogs are. Um, and so many times these things come on so quickly that owners feel guilty about, you know, oh my gosh, I should have known this sooner, but it's not anybody's fault. It just can happen. So I think, you know, we just need to give each other some grace. As well, well, I just got kind of nervous thing. though, because my Dexter doesn't jump well. He never I was has. just going to ask about that. So He's Dexter okay. shows no other signs of any other problems, but so he will I be worry? on the chair behind her and he's like, <laughs> and then sometimes he misses <laughs> the desk. So, you know, we chuckle at him from time to time, but there could be a neurological problem. But if it's not affecting in any other way, is it something we need to look into or is it just he's got an issue? <laughs> You know, that's a really good question, because uh, just like what Lady Gaga says, born this way, um, (laughs) sometimes these guys are born without a certain portion of their brain being developed well. And one of those parts of the brain without going into anatomy is that part of the brain called the cerebellum. And I don't know if your listeners or you guys are, you know, know about the condition called cerebellar hypoplasia, where that portion of the brain doesn't develop well, and it can be secondary to a viral infection. And it's non-progressive. So if Dexter is going about his daily business without a care, I wouldn't worry about it. Okay, Um, That could be just him. Yeah. Yeah. He's actually one of the least cats with the care in the world. He's he's just like anybody are, you know, fusses at him. He's just like, dude, can't we be friends? Give me a break. Yes. He's just (laughs) the most easygoing cat I have ever seen. Her easiest integration. He just like moved in and went high. (laughs) <laughs> I showed up on my That's deck and that was it. He knew. He knew exactly what he was getting into. He did. Yeah. He really on the other hand, yes. find a way. Yeah. The little exactly. sure. The little max I took in. He he ended up having toxoplasmosis infection of the brain stem on. I had to take him to a neurologist to diagnose. He started having, you know, his front limbs would stiffen. He had a few seizures. Dr. Faber thought massive doses of antibiotic that we might be able to get him through it, but we just couldn't. We had to let him go. Sometimes that can be overwhelming. But I think to that point, and and this is what's really interesting about neurology is, you know, what I do is first get my client into a room and let the cat walk around. And you know how kitty cats are. They don't sometimes like to be, you know, um, held too much. So it's all about observation. And also what my clients really, what they're, aspirations are in terms of, you know, what they want. Because again, as I had mentioned before, not everybody has thousands of dollars for imaging. So the first thing that I do is get a really good history, but also do my physical and neurologic exams. And it's a routine. I love just doing physical exams and and neuro exams, especially on little fractious kitties. They're, They're challenging. But the other thing about neurology that's really cool is when I see a kitty cat walking around, I can more or less tell what's wrong with them just without laying a hand on them. And then we go into the rest of our exam because some of these things, we want to look at progression. We want to see if things are getting worse and better, you know, because sometimes some older kitties with underlying heart disease or kidney issues can even get little strokes in their brain, just like we do. So, you know, it depends on the history. Did it come on quickly? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? You know, and to your point about seizures, not every kitty cat that has seizures is going to have something bad because we have a condition called epilepsy of unknown cause in, in kitties 
that um, they're almost like dogs just in that regard. They have seizures, which are short circuits in the thinking portion of the brain, and they can be managed very, very easily. Wow. I did not know that either. I, and that was a question I was going to ask you. So, you know, money's tight. I think my cat has a neurological disorder. I shouldn't naturally assume that bringing my cat to a neurologic specialist means I'm going to have to pay for an MRI. It's worth an investigation. There might have been an easier route. And I truthfully didn't spend us. a lot of money because my neurologist was like you. She could pretty much tell what was going on. And then she ran some blood work, I think, and other tests. But uh, it, it wasn't thousands, thankfully. Yeah. And I, I think that's important these days because money's tight. And, and why well, I always start and I talk with my owners about the basics. So let's get some blood work to make sure there's not a systemic reason for what's going on. And then we can talk about other things later. You know, it's that big exam and the expectations and what your goals are. Because I see a lot of animals in, uh, that, you know, have non-progressive disease and we talk about options and and a lot of times there's other systemic or metabolic things like heart disease and kidney disease that can cause secondary neurologic effects. So we always want to start with the basics and then we move on from there. I think that's really important. That's awesome. I know we're getting close to needing a break, but let me leave oh you God, with a five we're, minutes. Oh, okay, we're good. So a question. So we had a client uh, early on starting off. And we always encourage, because we can't force them, but it's always, did you get a vet check? So she'd been to the, her regular vet and had been cleared. And this cat was very reactive to noise, which we often see. And we can often desensitize them to that, work yeah, on that. This was extreme. This was something we'd never seen before. If this girl coughed, the cat attacked her. If she oh, accidentally goodness. dropped a fork. Dropped I a mean, fork. Can you imagine walking around in this wow. nervous state of eggshells and, oh, God, don't drop anything? You'd have to wrap yourself in bubble wrap so you'd like, right. just and not get everything and you didn't. own. And oh, my goodness. The cat had moments of being just lovely. And, of course, she was in love with this cat. But yeah. we had to, first time we ever had to say, this is above our pay grade. I'm sorry. You really need a neurologist. And I don't know what happened from there. But I remember that going something... and the, it got better. But it's been years since we yeah, did I, her. Yeah, I, I'd really like to know what happened happened but so is that something that's fairly common and relatable to something what does that tell you yeah and you know there's a condition and i don't want to get into the weeds here auditory seizures where seizures can come on just out of the blue in response to a noise so for example if you open a bag of potato chips or if you pop a, a bubble wrap or this something is my like balance that <laughs> be so cute. That could potentially stimulate seizures. And sometimes, especially in kitty cats, aggression can be associated with seizures. That because, was going to be one of my questions about aggression. Yep. Because cat seizures are vastly different than dog seizures. Cats will like suddenly attack out of the blue or they'll, they'll, their pupils will dilate, they'll vocalize, they'll like run and try to jump up the side of a wall or something like that. So much, much different. And dealing with a seizuring kitty is a little bit more dangerous than even dealing with a seizuring dog per se, because, you know, some of these kitties have claws and teeth and all that stuff. So now you're more apt to get bit or scratched. Yep. And answer to your question, you know, there are medicines and so forth and other things to do that we could intervene with. And again, sometimes we'll trial these guys on an anti-seizure medicine um, at first before we launch into a lot of different diagnostics just to see if we're on the right track. That's amazing. That never would have occurred to me in a million years. Me neither. That it could have been a seizure, right? I thought the cat was just scared to death of everything that moved. Yeah. And the other thing is, if the kitty is still alive now, chances are more likely that we didn't have anything noxious going on because God forbid if he had a tumor, that wouldn't have ended so well. I think so, we can find her. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go. Yeah, we're gonna have to check up on her. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, it was a very frustrating feeling. Like, I, sorry, there's, I, we have nothing left to give you. You've got to go see a neurologist. So. Plus, it's scary. It is scary. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll okay. continue talking about this because I have questions. We'll be right back. Molly, here's your dinner. <laughs> 
Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your cat tree tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. And welcome back to 19 Cats and Counting with Dr. Karen Klein, who is a feline neurologist. Oh, I think you do dogs too, right? Sure do. And an occasional horse or cow. Oh, wow. Sometimes. Uh, well, we're about talking that. about aggression and uh, neurological issues. I wanted to ask, so many general practice veterinarians are quick to put cats who have aggression or anxiety on Prozac, right? Now, we don't not believe in medication. There's times when Prozac is warranted. And we often say, if there's a neurological issue, maybe the Prozac, lifetime Prozac would be a valid option. If it's just behavioral, I think sometimes that gets in the way of diagnosing and fixing properly what's going on, but does it also mask the neurological issue that might be occurring that you're just going to, you know, given the cat Prozac and he's acting different, but maybe there was a reason for it. Yeah. And I agree. And that's where, you know, top of the line, you want to rule out anything else that could be affecting, you know, whether or not, um, and kitties and dogs for that matter, are just like humans, if they're painful. So remember that Cats will have an abnormal gait. Maybe they've got osteoarthritis or their muscles hurt. And there are some situations in in cats where we'll see um, inflammation of the muscle that can cause them to be really, really painful. So I do agree that, you know, I, I hold off on using anything like fluoxetine or Prozac unless, you know, I really have a good reason for that. Because, you know, just like in people, sometimes that can mask um, the progression of the disease or there may be some other confounding factor that could, you know, be more progressive. So um, we want to keep it simple. And, you know, there's other methods, um, you know, feel away and other things like that, especially when the cat comes to see me, you know, because some cats just coming into a veterinary office they get aggressive just because they're in a different place and the smells are different. So, yeah. So I always take it in the context of what, you know, the history is and and what's happening. Exactly. We like some holistic remedies or even gabapentin short term. Oh gosh. um, More than the long term. Cause you know, uh, uh, the thing too with Prozac, it takes so long to titrate up by the time you see if it's going to make an effect. Right. That's it. Oftentimes the person's given up and said, you know, forget it. I'm I'm just going to, with this cat in the shelter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the huge catalysts, if you'll excuse my pun, uh, right <laughs> now that we're seeing our feral cat, somebody's cat has lost their mind and is being aggressive and the doctor has given them fluoxetine Prozac and there's cats outside and we get rid of the cats, we yeah. get rid of the problems. Now we got to titrate back off of this antidepressant. The cat wasn't depressed. They were trying to protect their home. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Displaced aggression. That's huge. Oh, yeah. And, oh, you know, it's... You know, you have the screen and the kitty sees another kitty outside and all of a sudden they turn into some sort of monster when it's really not them. It's just their reaction to think about a person just reacting to someone lurking around. (laughs) We often say, we often do. I tell clients, okay, imagine you just, you just heard on the radio that one of America's top 10 most wanted is escaped from prison and was seen next door to your house. How are you you going to react? You're, exactly. You're, your partner walks in the room, you're going to cuff him one because you do, you know, you're so yeah. on anxious. Oh, yes, yes. That's how your cat is living. The and that's your is at the door. Yep. Brain's natural reaction to, to something scary is fight or flight, you know? And I think um, cats are like that. They'll be at stage one and then all of a sudden they're at stage 10, you know? So 
it's they may not even need to deal. see the cat just smelling them outside smell it yep yep and been there done that one yeah what other things should we be looking out for, Dr. Karen, as far as neurological issues with cats? I would say, you know, certainly we look at behavior, like you guys mentioned, but if we see circling or a head tilt, if the head is tilting like this, that probably could mean that we have an underlying problem with our ear, our inner ear, middle ear, what we call vestibular disease. Our balance system is off, much like if we have an ear infection or we have vertigo, kitty cats will get um, vestibular problems. So anything with that or circling or behavior changes. So if your kitty's not as affectionate or is not as responsive, or if they, if you rattle the the snack container and your kitty doesn't come running like most cats will do <laughs> you know that could potentially be an issue neurologically but again some cats that are painful may act the same way but it's the repetitive abnormal behaviors that we get worried about exactly especially when they aren't relieved by anything and they exactly yeah. yep what about cats like Pepper, Linda? Do you want to talk about Pepper? I, I really think that cat had a neurological Pepper, issue. I do too. Pepper was a client cat when Rita had the cat sitting business and I worked with her. And Pepper was a spicy girl. She only liked her daddy. Of course. No one else. And I mean, would attack. We had one attack. sitter that would take care of Pepper because she could see through to the wounded kitty that was... But she, they, they literally left, they left the room, a room by the door, door so that oh she could reach gosh. around and scoot the cat back. And she ha was very, very purposeful in her movements and what she did and how she did. And she had to lock herself in the bathroom when she was scooping the box because she'd get attacked. And oh, it geez. was so, and I mean, for years, this has been going on. And God bless this guy. He's like totally given up his love life. Yeah. He so have a relationship. He <laughs> can't have anybody in the house. They'll Pepper will eat their face. <laughs> Oh, geez. That's Nothing crazy. helped. I really think that was oh, a neurological wow. issue. Well, could have been. And again, sometimes, like I mentioned, seizures, weird seizures, because cats don't sometimes have, you know, paddling as a function of seizures. It can be more of a focal type of situation where they twitch a whisker or an ear, and that's all they're doing. And then post-seizure, they're kind of crazy and, and aggressive oh, yeah. sometimes, Oh, too. do cat, cats do the post-dictal thing? Yep. They can, they can. And I tell people to be very, very careful because just like in dogs, they don't know what they're doing. They may scratch, they may bite, especially with children in the house and everything. It's a, a scary situation. That's and sometimes cats will attack each other because, you know, the normal cat will see the the poor seizuring cat as um, some sort of aberrant creature and they'll start fighting. So it is it is a very big deal to not intervene right after, but to keep them in a small enclosed area and not not let them hurt themselves either or anybody Linda's else. daughter has Caesar, so she knows I I've the lived through post of a seizure. It's insane. Oh, wow. I mean insane like I need to go see my mom. I am your Oh, I mean, oh literally, boy. we have been through some stuff. Unfortunately, thank you, God. It's under control right now. But oh, there good. were some moments where I felt like I was battling somebody on bats. <laughs> oh, yeah, She's strong, can... too. She's abnormally strong. When yeah. She's yeah. Adrenaline. That that whole like when moms lift cars off of their children and things, you know, the superhuman effect. Yeah. It's good yeah, to know that, exactly. that that happens to cats, too, because, you know, we could get a lot of people that all of a sudden one cat attacks the other seemingly for no reason, even though they, they may be siblings that go along for years. We usually attribute it to outside cats or some kind of anxiety going on, but could well be some type of seizure abnormality happening. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's where we're looking at if they're abnormal in between the events or something like that. And owners are the best judge of that because they live with them every day. So it's just like, you know, um, and that's where I start with the history, because nine times out of 10, getting that history is going to tell us a lot more about where what choices we have for treatment. So. Let's say my cat loses their mind, acts up, chomps on me out of nowhere, but then it doesn't happen again. It's been a couple of months. Could this be a neurological problem? I mean, how, how far apart can seizures be spaced? Oh, gosh, that's a really good question. Sometimes they can have multiple in a day, or sometimes we can have them once a month, once every three months. 
I call, I tell my clients it's very unpredictable and that's the tough part. But when we intervene sometimes with medications is when they, you know, are occurring on a daily basis. I've had a couple of cats come into an exam room and they're actively seizuring and having like 65 focal seizures in, you know, five minutes. Wow. And the reason owners bring their cats in is because they're behaving weirdly or badly. And it's because they're persistently having seizures and you get them on, you know, a certain treatment regime if you ruled out anything else systemically and they're back to normal. So I think it's important, again, to use those powers of observation and really watch watch your your patient. That's what's so cool about neuro is you can tell a lot of times what's wrong with them, again, just by observation. So And realize that there is treatment, that, that cats can recover. I was laughing at your cat because he was doing circles. Oh, uh, was he cats, doing his circles? He does <laughs> not have a neurological <laughs> no, issue. No, oh, he's got something. Um, Rita's cat, Simba is four years old and she's never, well, he can be he's a pain in the butt, but he's not had now. any crazy, crazy things. A couple of months ago, out of nowhere, he bit her arm so bad. <gasps> she's still got scars out oh, of no. nowhere. And I mean, chomped. He now he hasn't done in. it since. No, and out of nowhere. We had just lost a cat. So we were trying to blame it on that, even though that didn't really feel break it. I don't know what through. it was. Maybe it was a seizure. So that's what I, that's why I asked. It was about Simba. I was thinking is we should keep an eye on this because if it happens that's again, maybe these are spaced out seizures or maybe that one happened while she was in proximity, which is why she got bit and she's missing. He was others. sitting on my lap quietly and all oh, of a sudden boy. stuck wow. in. Now, wow. Are there markers? Like, can you tell that a cat has had a seizure in the past or is there no leftover evidence? Unfortunately not. And that's the thing. If only our patients could tell us exactly what was going on, but we just don't have that luxury. Um, but they can happen out of the blue, but I would monitor it. It's possible it may never happen again, hopefully. But it does make you a little wary and, and you know, for scared. about a week, whenever he come to me, I'm like, I don't trust oh, you. Oh my gosh. You. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, you know, when you when you've lived with them for four years and nothing like that's ever happened, it's like something's up but he's very know. sweet normally yes he loves her a little but... derpy but he's sweet that's okay we all are <laughs> a bit of a troublemaker but yeah but he's the love. <laughs> we we love them despite it so i know we're coming up to the end of, of our program sadly but we would love to have you come back but are there any last things that you would like our audience to know about neurological issues or things they should be aware of yeah. And I, as I had mentioned before, you know, I, I think sometimes little cats get the bad end of the stick in terms of, you know, especially if they're having seizures or whatnot, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have something bad. So I think, you know, just getting to your veterinarian, if they recommend a specialist consultation, at least going in there with the mindset of what are my goals? What are my expectations? Maybe it's not going to be bad news at all. So we just need to make sure that, you know, we all work together um, because at the end of the day, healthcare can be really expensive. But first and foremost, if we need a specialist examination, they're going to just guide you through the process and make sure you're comfortable and, and then be there to follow up with you um, as time goes on. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you I thank can't you. thank you enough for being on our show. You're very welcome. It was great to have you guys. We have hey, a lot of topics lined up for you. <laughs> you want, yeah, you go we're going to have you back. We are it not done good with today. Dr. Karen. Good. Good, good, good. <laughs> Love to come back. If you happen to really be in the Charlotte area, anybody? Oh, yes, definitely. Anybody who's listening, if you're in the Charlotte area, Care Charlotte. There's a couple choices in Charlotte. Care Charlotte, they have the best staff. They won't charge you an arm and a leg. Dr. Faber is an amazing uh, neurological specialist. So I, I would implore you, have your cats checked out. Linda, as always, thank you for being my ride or die, my BFF, uh, my work wife as her husband calls. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Dr. Karen, thank you so much for your time. You're quite welcome. Amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. So, we can't thank beyond. you beyond. Mark Winter, thank you so much for this space on Pet Life Radio and for your awesome editing, making us sound so good. Uh, just remember, everyone, every day is Catterday. We'll see you next time. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.